Good afternoon. I'm Ozzy Colon, event coordinator at the Vegas Chamber. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to our first of a four part webinar series, Going Back to Work by Matter Real Estate Group. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to explain some features of this call. In order to preserve high sound quality, we will be muting everyone on the call besides our presenters to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you are joining this call on the web or through the mobile app, you can ask a question by using the chat feature on the interface. We will ask your question on your behalf. In order to preserve time, we ask that you please keep questions brief and we will be taking all questions at the end of the call. And now, please welcome the Vegas Chamber's President and CEO, Mary Beth Seewald, who will introduce our moderator. Thank you, Ozzy, and thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you in this brand new four-part webinar series called Going Back to Work in partnership with Matter Real Estate. We're really excited to be having this content today and to be able to provide it to you. You know, the Vegas Chamber has been extremely focused, as those of you know who have been on our webinars, we've been very focused on uh, helping our members acquire that ever important um, emergency financial assistance. And now as we pivot to the recovery phase, um, we're, we're really excited to be taking the lead along with Matter Real Estate on the best practices to help you to be able to reopen your business safely. So today's panelists, as you can see them on the screen, they're gonna to talk today about preparing the workplace, the future of doing business, wellness, and things like corporate culture. Um, our speakers are national experts. We want you to know that. They're on the leading edge of their industries, um, but they're gonna share with you some practical, doable uh, steps that you can take in preparing your workplace. Uh, this is the first in a four-part series, and the, the rest of the series are going to be every Wednesday for four weeks in a row. Uh, they're going to be titled The New Power Lunch, Your Brain on COVID, I especially like that one, How Fear Will Keep Your People from Their Best Work, and No More Hugs. So there's a lot of great information. Those titles really don't do the content justice, so we want to make sure that you, are, uh, you get the most out of this. We want to make sure that you ask your questions today. Uh, and, and our panelists are prepared for that. Um, I also want to remind everybody who's on today about our um, Friday edition of a virtual Eggs and Issues. It's this Friday, May 8th at 8.30 a.m. with Congressman Stephen Horsford. So you're definitely going to want to join us at the Vegas Chamber for Eggs and Issues with Congressman Horsford this Friday at 8.30. And now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce the moderator for today. His name is Mr. Tom Betton. Uh, Van Betten, Tom Van Betten. He's the Vice President of Strategic Partners with Matter Real Estate. Tom has more than 25 years experience in commercial real estate and has guided some of North America's top companies into new facilities. So Tom, I wanna thank you, first of all, for joining us today and thank you for moderating this excellent panel. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Mary Beth, uh, excited to be here. And, and again, I'm Tom Van Betten with Matter Real Estate Group. Um, we build office buildings and industrial buildings, and we get asked a lot by uh, our clients and customers and friends and colleagues uh, about this topic. How do we get back to the office? And so I'm excited to uh, bring in uh, this esteemed panel here, uh, an old friend, Daryl Fulbright, who is the global office practice lead for Gensler Architecture. Um, and I, I think it's safe to say, is Gensler... I think it's the largest architecture firm in the world, Daryl. It is. It is employee owned. So uh, excited to have Daryl, a, a fellow San Diegan here, here on the panel. He's going to be talking about um, what building owners and landlords uh, are doing to, you know, post COVID and, and, and what they should be doing. And so we're going to talk about, about the physical uh, actual built environments is what Daryl will be addressing. Um, and then I'd like to introduce Kylie Roth who is the Global Research Director for NOL. Uh, NOL is, uh, to me, first thing that pops into my mind is office furniture, but it's a lot more than that. It's a global uh, company with a lot of different brands, but she's gonna be fo focused on what's happening inside the walls of the office space um, and uh, more of the design intents and, and, and talking about furniture as would be part of her, 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 her discussion. So. Um, what I thought I'd also mention is because this is such a broad topic, uh, moving back to the office, I just thought I'd mention what we won't be addressing. Um, we won't be addressing, uh, you know, the types of PPE we should have in the office or, or, 
or mental health issues or uh, uh, even you know HR or, or, or disinfecting policies that we're, we're not health professionals I know it's Kylie likes to mention uh, we're real estate professionals but we're gonna really talking about the real estate today however those resources are important uh, uh, the guidelines and, and recommendations from OSHA and, and other uh, government agencies so th those that information is available on the website um, on vegaschamber.com right under the COVID-19 button but uh, again we're going to be talking about the, the the buildings and the inside the space uh, in, in your office space so with that said I, I'd like to talk about you know I'll start with you Daryl one of the biggest things I've noticed uh, the, the obvious shakes up to the daily routine is uh, um, the working from home I, I mean, here, here I am uh, hoping a dog doesn't bark in the background, but um, um, can you tell us a little bit about what, what maybe we've learned about ourselves through this work from home experiment? Sure, hey, uh, Tom, thanks thanks again for inviting us and including us in this uh, important discussion. Uh, we at Gensler have been doing a lot of internal research and polling a lot of our clients to, to, to find out some of the answers to these questions. I, I don't know that we're have all the answers, but we certainly have a perspective here that we, we, we like to share with our clients and, and with those of you today. Um, you know, working from home is, I think, is a great experiment. And what we found is that there's no better way than figuring out how, much, how well we work from home by just, other than just jumping into it and uh, having to do it by necessity. Um, but I, I think a lot of us uh, want to get back to the office. Uh, we've, we've had enough time sitting in our, in our, in our, uh, uh, off in our home offices or in our living rooms or our dining rooms and much, much other places that may not be the most efficient way to work. So I'd like to pivot a little bit about talking about how, how what, what are some of the things that we're going to expect as we go back into the office. Um, and I, I can tell you that, that from our experience, work as we know it will probably not look the same as we begin our phased approach back to the office. There's going to be a lot of things that are different. Um, there's going to be some limitations to social distancing. All of these things are going to be very uh, highly impacted by the local jurisdiction, the state, the county, and what those things come out with. And they're going to be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But we think that a fundamental thing is going to be this idea of social distancing. It will happen probably until we, we have a, a, a viable vaccine. And so when you talk about social distancing in buildings, it's going to impact both the buildings and the workplaces alike from seatings to restrooms to lobbies. And one of the biggest impacts is gonna be elevators, particularly in higher rise buildings. Um, we are you know, gonna be limitations on how many people can go into elevators. So you can imagine if you can only get four people in an elevator, um, how are you gonna get up to your space? You're, you're not gonna all do it at eight o'clock in the morning. You're not gonna all go to lunch at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. There's gonna be some sort of staggered um, uh, operations. Uh, I, I've heard the equation be, similar to a fast pass at Disneyland, where you, you sign up for the ride early, you sign up for the elevator the day before, I'm gonna be there at 9.15, and that's when your slot is so that we don't have long lines waiting for elevators, which become an issue as well. Uh, tennis will need to determine, you know, what are some of the essential functions that an office provides? What, what, what drives you back to the office? And that in turn is gonna determine who comes back to the office. Uh, we may see that happening in stages, uh, in different types of teams coming back independently of others. But we, we, we likely, as we stage back into this, are not going to see everybody coming. There, there isn't going to be a switch where we're going to be back to normal. There was kind of a switch where we got off normal, but coming back is going to be this very layered kind of phased approach. Um, there are some ex expectations that people should have from your building infrastructure, from your landlord. Uh, things that like how clean are your common areas? How clean is the air in your building? Does the building meet minimum jurisdictional requirements? Are these measures clearly communicated to help you instill confidence in your teams to actually get back to work? So those are some of the questions that you probably should be asking of your landlords as you are coming back. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll dig into that a little deeper as well. Uh, maybe Kylie, shifting over to you, you know, what are some pragmatic uh, workplace changes that, that you know, we can just do day one? Sure. And again, thank you for having me. It's been great to join you both and Daryl. Um, but yeah, Thanks. so like like Daryl, like Gensler here at Noel, we've been hosting a ton of roundtables and having conversations with clients. So I, we've been hosting at least three a week. So I wanted to share some pragmatic tips that we've heard. And, and, and honestly, we have, we're a manufacturing site. So we have employees in the office right now 
that are you know going into our plants every day they're essential workers providing furniture to people so some of the things that we've done and you know we've heard clients do that have essential workers in the office can be really pragmatic things so you know there's the idea and we as we bring people back there's things that you can do with the physical environment but there's also the idea of the perception of safety and so it, it, both of those are almost equally as important because you know we want to bring people back in an environment where they feel safe and have confidence so sometimes you know it's doing things that maybe don't you know i as i've always said and i talked to you yesterday i'm not an infectious disease doctor none of us on this call you know are infectious disease doctors but the perception of safety can be achieved in many things and that can provide a great comfort for employees so you know a lot of that is through communication as you know daryl had kind of mentioned but other things we've, we've heard clients do is you know staggering the workforce so if is it looking at an a and b team so does a team come in you know one week and b team come in the nether not that one is a or b over the other but how do you look at your workforce in that way or do you do every other day you know if you have a shared desk policy many people are kind of reducing that and do, and dedicating that to a a single person at the moment for the time being as they kind of relook at their strategy and very simple things such as you know we we have a client that is a, a, has an essential workers and one of the things that they've done is ask people to hold doors on hold open not to close doors for meeting to limit the amount of touch they provide people with cleaning material and ask them to to, to clean their desk in the beginning and the end of the day just to provide assurance and then even things such as, you know, we we in the design world love trash cans that are hidden and all those things that are really beautiful. But now is the time maybe to pull those out, set those out so that people can easily dispose of their, their materials that they might have cleaned their desk and in ways that don't require an extra touch point. As Daryl said, you know, in the future, we'll have these technologies. But right now, to get people back in the office safely, there are things that you can do in just a very pragmatic way to not, that doesn't have the technology of non-touch, just thinking about walking through the office and limiting those touches you know other things you know because some of these environments are off um are, are shorter in the circulation we've talked about you know are there circulation paths where you kind of really look at maybe even in the cafeterias if you have a large cafeteria if someone is navigating that you know creating a one-way circulation many companies are taking their cafeterias and only doing prepared food at the moment to really limit the number of, of touches in those type of environments and it's just, you know, a variety of different things around how to kind of, if you would imagine like walking through your office and just thinking, how can I limit touch? How can I provide environments, you know, removing chairs from conference rooms so that there's, it limits the number of people, you know, providing and posting signage on those conference rooms. And, you know, one of the, our clients said it best, I can only do so much, you know, you can't change a behavioral problem with physical things. So it's really communicating to employees about how they, you know, should behave in, in the office. And not that we're trying to create rules and limitations, but we want to create an environment where if everyone takes it as seriously as possible because you're caught even if you're you want to make sure that you're respecting your other employees as, as they may have different circumstances than you so taking those policies and kind of creating some behavioral aspects about the office too a couple of interesting points uh, there's a photo that was sent to us from our shanghai office and inside the elevator was this glued on like dispenser with with cotton ball q-tips that you could pull out and touch the elevator button and then drop it in the trash so you didn't have to touch the elevator button so there's a lot of stories like that that i think are short-term stories that we want to address from a design perspective longer term you know daryl are you seeing you mentioned uh, decals as well like maybe or or uh you know carpet patterns that where, where, yes. where you can actually see the the, the barrier uh, that you shouldn't enter on someone's desk or can you talk about there, that? There's gonna, yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of, of that going on. Again, uh, uh, all about that transparency. I think people feel safer when they know there's a plan in place and that it's clearly communicated. So how we can do that with, with signage and graphics is going to be hugely important. Um, we even talked about having you know large large flat screens and lobbies that, that outline all of the procedures in the building so that, so that people all know what's going on and they're very aware of it. But it's like it's that instilling confidence but certainly social distancing is going to dictate a lot of things for instance you can't have an open restroom that anybody can go into it's going to have to be some sort of system where you know there's only two people allowed in a restroom or whatever it is at a time so how do you communicate that how do you deal with that uh, th those are all things that we're that we're you know looking into right now and helping our building owners with the strategy and, and Kylie, one one more sorry one more thing on the furniture i know um, we, we all don't want to go back to the Dilbert Hyde cubes. Um, 
tell me we're not, please. But is the physical barriers required? So we are, you know, some companies that we're working with are looking at providing more screening in their workplace. There's a couple of different options that we've been studying, like the temporary. Can we make beautiful temporary screens that if this, you know, does change in a couple of months or a couple of years that we can remove those things? Or some companies are looking at providing, you know, glass or enclosures to kind of, again, a lot of that is from the perception and trying to create. And one thing we do caution, and, you know, we're, some people don't think about it now because we're thinking about cleanability and providing privacy is as we think about about this you know make sure you also think about acoustics because you don't want to solve one problem with by creating another so if you're looking if you already have a very hard surface environment adding more hard surfaces could create an acoustical problem that then you would need to come back and address at a later time so thinking about those those type of things now so being reactionary but not going you know reacting but not being too reactionary to, to kind of create some of the, those things you know one of the one of the things that we see in the uh, that we do this thing called the Gensler Workplace Survey, and and we've been doing it for almost a decade now. And there's this constant pull between focus space and collaboration space, as you know, Kylie. And I I think we're going to see that 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 pendulum swing more towards that focus space again. So the square foot per person is going to start to slow down. We've seen this rapid increase in the square foot per person on TI spaces. I think we're going to see an easing of that. So even if you have open open spacing like benching, you're going to see larger benches and more spread out employees as we go forward. Yeah, you know, and, and many things is to get people back into work. You know, reducing as you said the head count. You know, so maybe only a percentage of the people. And I think most companies, I have not turned to anyone that you know one day is switched and everyone's back in the office. So phasing people, you know, looking at every other desk from now just to try to move people in. And, and then, you know, one thing that you picked up on, Daryl, I don't think that this is a time when you can over communicate anything. So just communicate, communicate and communicate in a multiple different forms. You know, everyone learns differency, different. So like communicating by email, doing town halls, things that, that we're doing, um, just really helps people have an understanding and a sense of what's going on. And I think it helps ease some of the fears. I wrote down, you know, one of the, the, one of the panels that you guys, the, the chamber has coming up is the fear. And I think that there's a lot of uncertainty. And the most thing, the way you can help people understand and reduce those fears is really talking about all the things that you are doing within the environment. This is a, a time to share all the things that you are doing, but also get some input. But I wouldn't just ask them what you want them to do because then it looks like you haven't thought about anything. So list all the things that you're gonna do and then ask, is there anything else that kind of we can do to help address this or eliminate some of those fears? I, I would say an engagement and a discussion between landlords and tenants is really helpful in this condition, right? What are the things that the tenants are really concerned about? What are their, what are their teams or their uh, staff really concerned about? So having that internal communication within the tenant groups and then communicating those with the landlords and and coming up with uh, with solutions that everybody's uh, rowing in the same same direction on solving some of these issues is real important. Yeah, I heard I heard a few tenants that were surprised at how few landlords had reached out to them um, to let them know proactively what they may be doing. Um, you know, I, I will tell you at, at at Gensler right now as part of our back to work strategy, there will be a component where we have a list of things that we're requiring of our landlords in order to get our people back to work. So that's something that we're gonna be pushing. And I would think a lot of larger companies like ours uh, that have a bigger footprint will be doing the same. So they'll be starting to nudge these landlords into certain, taking certain uh, minimum minimum uh, precautions. Well, that's, yeah, a, that's a good, oh, go ahead, Kathy. I was gonna say, yeah, no, one of our flagship is in New York City, and we were we've just been in contact with our landlord who's putting in temperature checks that will visually, or not visually, but without any contact that will be able to, to trace and, and and understand if people have, you know, ab above average temperature. It's 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 on the employer to do something with that information. You know, the the, the landlord's not taking that ownership to tell or communicate that strategy, but they're providing some of the information to help make that because they obviously have to support all the people that are coming into that environment and keep everyone safe. Yeah, interesting. And and maybe a good segue into, you know, we started uh, this this with webinar with really talking about what we can do day one, what can we do today? Um, and now, now I'd like to transition to, to tomorrow, which is, you know, not literally, but, you know, moving forward, looking past these uh, uh, immediate, in, Things. So what, what what do we need to be thinking about, Daryl? You mentioned you know this communication with the landlord. You know wh wh what should landlords be doing 
to prepare to, to, to make their environment safer for their tenants? And, and, how, and what are some good communication ideas there? So uh, from a communication perspective, you know, I think the, the old adage is you can, like you said, like Kylie said, you can't communicate enough, right? So is it on a website? Is it on a handout? Is it, on, is it in screens on the, uh, in the lobby? Uh, is it in your mobile app that you create for your building so that it's constantly being updated? I think there's lots of ways to communicate, but uh, shifting into some of the things we're encouraging um, landlords to consider as we go into, say, day two of this uh, back to work stage thing is we're very much encouraging them to look at their mechanical systems, to find ways to increase the air quality in their buildings. And that can be done through a number of ways. It can be done through filtration, additional air in the building. There's alternative systems you can look at, lots of different ways to address that. Uh, restrooms are another area that, that we really uh, think there can be some improvements. Simple things like swinging doors in the right direction without latches, or even airport style restrooms with no doors. Uh, adding toilet seats to commercial restrooms. Uh, when we flush the toilet, there's a lot of activity that goes there that's not helpful. So adding toilet seats before flushing, making sure that everything that can be touchless is touchless, such as flushing towels, faucets. I think many facilities have those today. And finally, shifting away from blow drying features that can cause concern as well, because those can blow particles in the air and uh, that we're not, you know, at least temporarily, we're not looking, looking to, to engage those as much. Uh, and finally, from, a, from an amenity perspective, you know, before this all hit, it was all about what amenities can you provide to the tenants, right? Is there a conference center? Is there gyms and fitness and all these things? I think, you know, initially those are going to probably be off limits. But uh, as we focus into them more, we're going to have to understand how they can be used and, and what is the best way to facilitate some of those back coming back online. But as, as we look to the future, I, I think we're going to look at more wellness focused amenities. Uh, we've been recently talking about outdoor fitness routines, getting people out of the buildings, um, to even adding small medical clinics to assist, assist in screening, uh, and engaging tenant spaces with direct uh, access to functional outdoor spaces. You know, we've talking about from a practice area perspective, uh, this trend towards indoor outdoor spaces is, to, as Tom, as you know, uh, BOMA has allowed uh, tenant, uh, landlords to charge rent on those when they're functional. So really engaging those indoor outdoor spaces that you can engage with the outdoors is something we're seeing. Yeah, I think fresh air has never been uh, as important. And then that seems to be some of our tenants and clients are asking, how can you turn up the fresh air, filtration, humidity, all these things that people weren't paying much attention to are now top of mind. Absolutely. You know, Kylie, are you seeing, uh, I know it's early, but are you seeing lo any longer term trends on how maybe layouts, you know, are, are we going to have to have to have neighborhoods in, in, in offices or, or is it just, you know, that block of cubes is just not seems to be sustainable? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing looking at, as Daryl mentioned, like more distancing and not like at the first we're really social distancing, right? We're trying to create people from interacting, but as we look at this long term, I do think we're going to see a reprieve some from some of the metrics that we've been so tied to, you know, that densification and and it's still important, you know, costs are still important. You can't, you know, especially in a time like now, but we're going to see more relaxation within the office. We're going to see what we're calling kind of at Noel, the comfortable office. We're going to see it be a little bit more relaxed. There's going to be some space, a little spaciousness to it. And like, we're even looking at products that have like plants that as you kind of talked in, you know, that plant power um, kind of bring in and help maybe use that as some dividers. We're going to definitely see more screening and in different environments. And we're also gonna see what we're calling a little bit more of open architecture. So a lot of our conference rooms today are very closed door, right? Like, so you have hard walls and, and doors. So is there ways to create kind of more open architecture where you can do things with, with things that have more of a open ceiling. So you're not kind of creating that that stagnant air as you guys have talked about is so important with ventilation in, in these office type of buildings. So I just think we're going to see what we're calling, you know, this move from health and safety, which is extremely important to the idea of integrating that into more of like a comfort environment, which includes a little more well-being and how can, you know, and that includes anything from, I know it's hard to talk about now, but like colors, materiality, things that make us feel comfortable in the office environment as we kind of navigate through this, you know, because 
we all don't want to work in hospitals, right? So we don't want our, the environments that we come into to feel like that. We want them to have that hospital-like cleanability right now, but we don't want it to feel like a sterile environment. I mean, that's what makes the workplace fun or exciting or a place you want to go is because of that, that liveliness. You know, picking up on kind of one of Daryl's points earlier is, you know, we have heard, you know, it was the place to collaborate and I think it will be again. But right now in, in, in the moment, we've actually heard a lot of, it, of parents that are the ones that want to get back into the office because they want focus. So they see the office as the focus time right now, because I don't know about you, but, you know, I have my two year old in the next room. I have all these people. So my home is chaotic. I want to go to the office to have a reprieve from from some of the things that I'm experiencing. So we think it has to be able to balance both that focus, but also also the collaboration of bringing them together. That's great. You know, and you know, it'd be remiss not to to bring you know technology into this discussion uh, and how it's going to help us you know solve for some of the connectivity uh, that uh, that we're missing in person. And uh, what what sort of technology are out there that is going to support the new culture of of you know virtual meetings? Well, I know I mean, many similar to the technologies that we're on now. I mean, I think, you know, we have a lot of Zoom. I mean, there are the articles about Zoom gloom. Um, <laughs> I don't read that. Yeah. Zoom gloom. Zoom gloom. You know, no, not affiliated with Zoom, so I don't, you know, we all have our own platforms or anything, so we don't want to pick them out or so. But like, we are going to see a lot more of this. And I think the challenge as we come back into the office is, you know, right now, as a person who's worked remotely for quite a while, even before the pandemic, is how do we create equality in that kind of environment when four people are in the room and four people are out of the room? Because right now, if everyone looking at us, we're all equal. We all have our little two by two square or four by four square, depending on how big people made us. You know, So how do we kind of create that, that, that same environment? We're gonna see, as Daryl talked about, a lot, a lot more touchless technology and recognition within the office environment that's just going to make things easier um, as we can, can kind of navigate. I mean, things that we were already looking at as, are, you know, height adjustable tables that are able to go up and down on their own or just with minimal amount of touching. So lots of things. Things like the uh, the lift gate on a Ford, right? We just wave your foot and the thing opens by itself. I think we're going to see that integrated into a lot of different uh, materialities going forward. In fact, I, I could see where you walk into a restroom and you use your motion to open the, the toilet the toilet door, right? So that you're not touching anything. I think I think you're going to see a lot of technologies like that going forward. I think one of the big questions that a lot of people have is is you know work from home is going to stick with us. You know we've been talking about work from home for quite a while, and I think the one thing this event has taught us is that it's it's feasible to some degree. So the question is how much is it going to stick with us? And what is that going to do to real estate footprints? Are you going to need more space? You're going to need less space, you know. And and I think I think they're going to somewhat counteract each other, right? I think the the idea that you're going to need more space per, per person for the people that are coming into the office because you're you're not going to want to be so tightly packed is going to be offset somewhat by you know some percentage of people working from home. So the best estimates we don't know where that's going to go. Uh, that's a crystal ball. The best estimates I see is that it might be a net neutral where you may need the same amount of space and you're not going to reduce your footprint, but you're not going to increase your footprint based on a lot of the things that you're seeing. Sure. Yeah, because great. we do see, you know, as Daryl kind of talked about, a lot of work from home and many companies have found that they've been successful at it, at least in the short term. We do, you know, wonder how long there is some aspect. It, it, it does take, we are working harder and longer than we typically work. It does take a little longer sometimes to do things that are work from home that, you know, that easy five minute walk over to someone's desk and have a quick chat often takes 30 minutes because you schedule things in 30 minute blocks. So it yeah. takes longer to get things done work from home. So we do have to think about some of those things. And, you know, we're all working really hard right now because this is all new. So coming, bringing some of that back when we come to. Yeah, but Daryl, what are you talking about? You were mentioning something about an app in your in your in your Chinese office or something, um, Daryl. Some applications from your phone that would be driving uh, building systems. And well, you know, in, in China, and again, I, I don't see that happening necessarily here, but there certainly is a system in China where you have a green, yellow, or red card, and that tells you have you been in contact through basically geolocating everybody's phone to see if somebody's tested positive. And if you come in contact with somebody like that, you either get a red or a, a yellow card and you're not allowed into certain facilities without a green card. Um, I don't see that happening here in the United States because of a lot of you know, civil liberties and 
and basic rights that we have over here. But I could see an opt-in system where uh, maybe communities, uh, such as in Commons potentially, could have that where the community opts into that. And there's a system where everybody within that community uh, opts into that system to really know that they have a, a competence of a safe environment. I know that some of the technology firms that we're working with uh, are, are working on systems like that and probably will engage those internally as their as their closed environments are, are, are engaged. So that is something that I think is uh, is a way to, to bring back that confidence and really get people more engaged from a conference. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's 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 transition into the. I do want to mention to the to people watching, we are going to get to Q and A in about ten minutes, um, so uh, we'll have plenty of time for that. But uh, I do want to kind of shift now to maybe even longer. I know we did today, tomorrow. Now let's talk about the future. You know, how how can landlords future proof? their buildings and how can tenants and companies um, really prepare for for the longer term implications and are there any game changers out there that uh, that we should you know at least be be keeping our eye on uh, in the longer term maybe daryl i'll start with you yeah sure so um i think we mentioned this touched us a little bit but this idea of touchless systems that are connected to our mobile phones you know i, I think they're going to become ubiquitous there are people talking about those systems they're going to tie into opening the front door for you uh, so that you, you know, that it recognizes that you're coming in and the door opens, the elevator's called to you and takes you to your floor, opens for you when you get there. Uh, there's Bluetooth technology on your phone that can give proximity readers. Uh, there may even be automatic suite doors so you don't have to touch the, the suite door. Uh, it may know uh, different preferences you like, like how you like your coffee, and it may have the coffee machine set up for you. These ideas, smart building systems. Um, that it knows when you have a conference, so it can throttle on or throttle down the air conditioning in a conference room. Uh, it can it can raise the shades or lower the shades. So there's a lot of personal preference things that can be built into these smart systems uh, that will be all tied to our mobile phones because we're all going to have mobile phones in the future. We'll have to opt into these things, but I I, I think that that those things are going to become much more ubiquitous as we go forward. They also can can be notification systems as part of our communication systems where they really inform you the current state of what your office is doing as far as any emergencies or the building is status and all those things so it's real-time information and and highly communicative uh, uh platform and then the other thing I, I i think is is this idea of this well certification so well certification is is similar to what lead is which really addresses climate change and energy as its focus uh well focuses uh, on the occupant's health and welfare and addresses specific building impacts, including clean air, uh, connections to the outdoors, uh, things like biophilia, which are natural design elements. Kylie talked about integrating landscape elements into her furniture system, so I, so I can see really tying into this. And this idea of an open stair access, so that people have the option to take the stair and get exercise as opposed to going right into an elevator. Um, we see that as one of the few current standards that addresses both the virus impacts, but really looks at it from a longer term view, right? And and talks about how how uh, we can use this 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 current sister situation to really promote healthier environments that are beyond COVID, beyond any any virus. So those are the two key things I see going forward, at least in in, in office buildings for new development and potentially for some existing buildings. Yeah. And yeah. even so I would just say, like, you know, I've always said that we can't predict the future, but we can help prepare for it. So one of the main ways that you can help prepare for what that future is, is staying flexible. So we're going to see furniture and items within that have the ability to flex and change and adapt to an office that needs to hold 100 people or in the next day, maybe hold 50 people. It needs to be able to have that adjusted so that we're prepared for changes like this, whether it be a pandemic, whether it be a, a fire or some other type of, of, of natural disaster that may cause the environment to change, I think we're going to see a lot more flexibility inherently built into the environment that people can adapt and, and change it so that it meets the needs of the users without having to come in and add a bunch of stuff so that it can adapt over time. And then we're going to, I think on the, the, the more positive and I, I like to think of it i would i'm not an optimistic person by but i'm not a pessimist but i'm very realist but i ha, i tend to think of this as a, an opportune time there there's i think there's an optimism that i have at least you know maybe the short term and even the the tomorrow looks a little 
uncertain. I do think that we're going to come out of this with more humane, more comfortable environments that where people, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, you know, what the environment is going to do and how these things, but if we really think about it, all the people on this call, we have the ability to control what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like, because we create those environments. The virus, we can't control. We can't control what happens there. And we need to provide safety for our employees and all that, but we can control the environment and how that feels and the environment that they come into. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Obviously, it needs to be cleanable, but we're going to see things that have the spaciousness and, and that more humane, human, bringing humanity kind of back into the office a little bit. Not that it ever really left, but sometimes we get, we get focused on the metrics instead of the meaning or the purpose. And I think we're going to have a renewed sense of, of why we come and, and why we're really there. And, you know, I don't know about you, but like as a remote worker, I'm like, I have little hearts drawn around the office. I can't wait to at least collect collaborate with someone in person because um, this is great but it's not the same yeah i had a, I had a, a recent uh, remote meeting with uh with a construction project that we're working on we've got a big office project under construction here in san diego and uh one of the and we're not doing on-site meetings anymore because everything's isolated and one of the things that the, the guy says well i need you to come out and look at a look at a sample and i'm like thank god any any excuse to get us out of the house you know can I go move gravel around for you? Because I just want to give an excuse yeah. to get in my car and drive out of the house. So I, yeah. I think there is definitely pent up demand and people are looking forward to connecting. And making well, those and I, I like that positive the note there, Kylie. And I think Daryl, what do you think is 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 good is going to come out of this this pandemic? I mean, uh, from design implications or or humanity. I mean, what, what, give me something good that that, that we could think. Again, I, I I would I would. I would parallel what Kylie's saying. I, I think, first of all, flexibility is huge, right? Uh, because we're going to have to have mechanical systems that that can handle a crisis, but then can get back to normal mode. So there's things, little things like that. But but I I, I think that that this idea that we've been touching on it, on creating healthier places for people to really thrive, we kind of paid attention to it. We kind of made a nod to it. I think this is going to focus us to really make an effort to make these spaces healthy and make them so that they're such a driver. That they're even healthier than staying at home, right? So, what is it about an office environment that it's so great? The water's cleaner, the, the air is cleaner, the people are, are engaged, they're, they're biophilic elements. There is this feeling that you have to be in the office because it's even better than working. So, that's really what I think is going to happen. And I, I think it's really going to light a fire in the designers to find all those things that, that really make that, that compelling argument that you want to be in the office, not just because you've been sequestered at home and can't wait to get out. But there's a propelling argument for you to get back to that. You know, one, and, and I think this is not something that should be taken lightly. For instance, I had heard uh, uh, from a friend of mine that uh, works at Google that essentially Google had, and you might know more than me, Daryl, that giant plans for global expansion that have all but on put on hold, and, and they've been put on hold to to really reimagine their plans, you know, post COVID, and 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 so. You know, big technology companies typically are are, are leading the, on the progression of, of design and things. So it was interesting to hear that at that level. And I'm sure you have stories, similar stories. You know, I, I will say from some of our other tech clients that I can't name, uh, a lot of them are business as usual. They, they see this as a long-term play, very positive. Uh, they realize there's going to be short-term interruptions, but they're looking at this as, you know, two to three years down the road and it's business as usual. So I'm not seeing the same stoppages that you that you just progressed uh, with some of the other tech clients. Uh, I, I think a lot of them believe that uh, the technology will help solve this, you know, that, that they're, that's their business. And, you know, these platforms as you're seeing in China can help instill confidence and really start to help trace this. And I think that they have their own ecosystems that can help do this. You know, Google and Apple has been well publicized are working on a system similar to what's in China. So I think a lot of these opt-in systems and i think there's a lot of positivity i see from a lot of the tech clients that we're working with. i think there's going to be a positivity, and this is kind of outside the workplace but one of the things i was studying before the pandemic was generation z where we were really looking at them and you know they're one of the most 
diverse workplace workforces that we'll ever see um, in, in the future. I mean, it will continue to see more diversity, but the, the idea that we have work from home, we're going to go back to the office, but we have established that it does work. We're going to see greater amounts of people that are not in the home base. And that's going to allow for a more diverse workforce, which I think always makes a company better. We're going to allow, we're going to see more people that might be on the spectrum that was, that didn't want to come into the office because that gave them anxiety. So we're going to see people that maybe are work in different countries that have the ability to work with us in real time. So I think the one thing that, you know, is really positive, someone gives me about the work from home, it does work. We've able, we want to do it all the time. No, but maybe we have opened up the diversity of who can work in our environments. That's not just in the location next door. And I think that's really positive. I, I would well, echo that. I'd say, you know, from a Gensler perspective, uh, we like to bring global teams to local, local solutions. And what we've realized now that there's absolutely no excuse not to do that because we can be working with people in, in London or in Singapore uh, that are just as close as people down the street with this new technology. So you know, we, we've done it in the past, and I think this has reinvigorated our, our ability to uh, really work globally and bring that global perspective to all the solutions. That we're working with. Well, and, and I'm glad you guys, uh, the first question just came in, and it says, are you seeing work at home, a longer term trend, or do your clients see more of a need for permanent office space? I think we've addressed that pretty, pretty well today, but, uh, um, you know, any final thoughts on that comment? Combination of both. Some combination of both. What what that combination is will be highly dependent on what organization you have. Um, you know, there's Richard Florida talks about the creative class and uh, what, what, where we've seen a lot of knowledge workers going towards creative industries. Those industries need to be together to innovate. It's very difficult. You know, Zoom is a great tool or GoToMeet or any of these. It's much more difficult to collaborate and to innovate uh, on these systems from working from home. So. You're going to see the creative class drive us out of this, out of this, back to that really strong desire to be back in the office. So it depends. You know, I think, Tom, we talked a little bit about call centers. You know, call centers don't need to collaborate. So that work may end up being more work from home. But there, the other industries will very much need to have that collaboration and an idea of chance interactions to really uh, push innovation. Well, and call centers are always the most dense, you know, headcount use anyway so that's probably had to had to change um daryl what do you think about co-working uh, you know it, which is as everyone knows uh, most everyone knows is the, you know the we work big example but where you you have short term monthly uh, you know subscriptions and and, and, you, and you, you really share space at, at a level that i just can't imagine you know, I, I think the uh, the old regis model which is the old original co-working space where people had dedicated offices and went into an office and rented an office or rented a dedicated space, that'll be around. But this idea that you're coming in and you just pick a space anywhere you want, I, I think people are gonna be a little resistant to that, myself. Um, I think the biggest place for co-working is really on flex space for large corporate users where they don't want to uh, commit long-term to a larger space. So they'll commit to three quarters of their space and then they'll have the swing space with somebody like we, we work where they rent a floor for them or a part of a floor. But I, I think this whole idea of hoteling and, and using, you know, having three different or four, five different people at the same desk throughout the day, it, there's going to be a, a bit of an ick factor to that for a while. <laughs> I actually have space in a co-working space. So one of the things we are doing or, you know, the communication, one, I applaud them for the communication that they've been doing too, because, you know, as independent workers, you know, I work for a corporation, but a lot of the colleagues in the co-working space are independent. But, you know, they have looked at, especially at least for now, more assigned seating in those type of environments. You know, I, I think it'll be interesting how over time, you know, if those relax at all, but I do think we, 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 People do want dedicated spaces, if nothing else, for the day, you know, so that they know that that was cleaned in the environment. I think another thing that you're going to see, maybe not related to co-working, but cleaning is not going to be a back of the house issue. People want to see cleaning, cleaning people in the focus. You know, you don't, it used to be something that mysteriously happened late at night unless you work late. You didn't see it. I think you're going to see people want to see people out cleaning the environment. So they're going to happen throughout the day. You know, and I think that's going to take place in co-working space. You know, I, I do think, you know, like Daryl said, people are going to look at their workplace strategies and real estate strategies and see how co-working comes into that, that situation. And companies will use it as a real estate strategy. Mm -hmm. But I do 
people want more defined space and ownership of things. But you know, I, I think it's also interesting the co-working model. The co-working model was built because we asked people to work from home, right? So they created a whole class that never existed in the office environment workplace because people were working from home and they felt isolated. So then it became co-working. So now we're saying we're gonna work from home again and no one's gonna co. So it's just an interesting model of how 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 workplace segments get built out of how, how we, we're navigating the environment. Well, in my experience with the, with co-working, and I've toured, you know, dozens of them and worked with them, and uh, it's uh, a lot of it was all driven about that uh, community and being a part of that community. And so when you when you isolate people and and change that dynamic, um, you know, it's 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 a bigger issue. Uh, we have another question here. It's uh, fairly you know pragmatic but daryl maybe you have a comment this is asking about if there's use of uh uv lights at, in office space for 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 you know getting rid of the virus no so there's there's lots of first of all uv radiation is is like sunlight so if you spend too much time under direct sun you're going to get potential skin skin issues so uv uv light is a very sensitive subject it's something that that we've read about looked at we're not uv experts but i i there are some systems out there that that can uh, work in ducting and in uh, in mechanical systems to clean the air in non-visible locations. I've read about some systems that may be employed in restrooms that would only click on when nobody's in the restroom. Mm. Uh, those are experimental and uh, have had their you know issues because you wouldn't want a person in there while that's going on. Um, there is even some research about some high band or different types of UV radiation that that may not be harmful to humans, but may may uh, attach against pathogens. Uh, that's still in the very experimental stage, but I, I think there's more to come on that. There's, uh, you know, we've been using them in ducts and in, and in mechanical systems for, for a long time. So you will see an increase in that um, because it's a tried and true method. In the other areas, it's very experimental and I think we'll have to wait and see whether, whether that's gonna be an effective approach. Don't want the solution to be worse than the... Than the... Yeah, exactly. You know, this is an interesting question. Companies that previously did not allow a work from home policy now see that it works and are considering moving more in that direction and reducing their office operations. What are some tactics or incentives that would be offered to try and keep businesses leasing their space? And it, what's interesting, I, I'll take that one first one because I think you, you addressed it earlier, uh, uh, Daryl, and I think that's, that's really, you know, safety and, and, and productivity. Agreed. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I, I think every company has to look at it for themselves. But one thing that's very different, and I, I am not a legal expert or a taxation expert, but it's very different when a the government mandates you or your local state, you know, ask you to stay at home than when a, when your employer asks you to stay. So there are taxation things of the taxable benefits of providing some employer things. So it's not, I think if companies are thinking about it, you really need to think about it as a very strategic approach. And it's just not a way to save money off of your balance sheet because there are implications and things to think about when you have employees working from home. So I would just say, you know, don't don't rush in without critically thinking about all the aspects of what a work from home strategy looks like. But I do think you know what things to do i mean make environments really great you know stop talking about like you know how dense can we get these environments and start talking a little bit more about like how we can create these environments for people and i know that sounds trite but like think about it as really creating really really great environments for people because right now if i had a better place to be darn well i would be there <laughs> But, well, that's I, a, but I also think that the work flex work from home thing is is more about flexibility. It's not a solution. It's about flexibility, right? So somebody needs to go pick up their kid from school, you know, and they happen to have a meeting, so they can do the meeting on go to. We have the technology in the office, so some of the people are in the office, the client may not be in the office anymore. So there's this technology technology driven solution to have flexibility. I, I don't see it as a as a long term solution unless you're one of those companies that really doesn't innovate and doesn't have creative thought, like, like call centers potentially. But most, most groups have some sense of innovation and some sense of culture that they're trying to keep. I know one of your future calls is gonna be on maintaining company culture. So having that culture, uh, we, know that, we know that people really wanna work for a good culture. And when they're working from home, they're kind of in their own culture. So how do you, 
how do you promote that great culture and, and really in, emphasize that with the workplace environment? Yeah. So I, sorry, two things. One thing I think, you know, call centers might be one, but I, I think call centers have also changed over, you know, there many of those people are cross, are, are tasked with upselling, cross-selling, and, you know, are almost yep. sales, in, in some sense, sales. So it's not just an, the friendly voice on the phone. So, you know, if you, that, so you also have to look at that, you know, because those, those, they are knowledge and skilled workers and there is some collaboration aspect of that. So, you know, there may be one group that could work from home, but there is some different aspects. And then the other thing, back to your question of, you know, how keeping us connected and Daryl, you know, did mention the flexibility. One of the things we've been doing at Noel lately, even a little bit before the pandemic, is every meeting went out with a, a, a call-in number, even if it was always in person, just in case you had to go pick up your kid or you had to go. It was always there and you didn't have to be like, oh, send me the meeting. It was just automatically in there. That's a good one. That's a good one. And uh, there's another term I heard I, that a friend of mine was complaining about who runs a company uh, from the work from home, cyber slacking. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've also heard that everyone's working a lot harder from home. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting. My, my equation is I'm running twice as hard to get to the same point every day. Mm because it just takes longer to get things done. So less efficient. You know, it, it's not as efficient as being in the, in the, in the workplace. And I, I would say, you know, I've got a dedicated office at home. I've got, I've got most of the tools, but it's just that missing that in-person connection where you're really, be, like, like Kylie said, taking care of something five minutes over a desk as opposed to a 30 minute call that you set up. It's just that efficiency is, is lost. Yeah. So there's some, there's some drawbacks. I think one of the best analogies I heard was someone equated it to the New Year's. So in the beginning of the New Year's kind of work from home, it seems like it's working. You're going back to the gym. You feel healthy. You're going. You're going to dedicate. You're going to eat healthy. But what's going to happen over time, right? Because we are working extra hours. We're working really hard. You know, are we going to start slacking off and eating the Cheeto? And I'm saying, like, I'm not talking about your fact, but like, you know, at some point we're working so hard because we're trying to keep things moving. And, you know, we know this is tough times, but like, at what point do you stop going to the gym? Do you feel like it's not working? Do you miss that collaboration? Do you just want to get back? So we are, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert, but like in that type of thing, but like, is there a sense of a, a false reality about how well things are working. And I hope it's not, but I hope, you know, I do think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I'm working four hours a night longer than I used to. So, you know, I think, you know, because of those things of 30 minute meetings that could be five minute meetings or those quick touch points. I, I do think one of the challenges that, that will float to the top though, is these really people that commute a long period of time are ones that may 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 have a challenge doing that commute again, but uh, yeah. and, and I think uh, you yeah, know I think Daryl, you live about three minutes from your from your office, but uh, yeah, I gotta get I gotta get in my car because I'm worried about the battery dying on it, so I just get in and drive <laughs> around for a while, right? <laughs> All right, here's another question that I think you'll like, Daryl. Are you seeing any new materials and finishes for new developments to adhere to the, the you know sanitation requirements or? Distancing, so I, but. I think that I think the word is really still out on that. There, you know, there, there are these ideas of antimicrobial finishes. Do they really work? Uh, are they really? You know, there, there, there's discussion about copper as something that, that, that you know, there, do droplets last longer? Again, I'm not an infectious disease an, uh, expert here, but but do droplets uh, have you know, do viruses or, or pathogens last longer on certain materials than others? I don't think. There's a lot of evidence that's that's backing that up right now. Um, that may change, but I, right now, I, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I, I think it's more in the technology. For instance, you know, there is a uh, elevator button control system that Mitsubishi has that's touchless. It senses your finger rather than having to touch it. So, you know, those kinds of things are interesting. But the idea that you're going to grab on a hand, on one handle versus another handle and not have to wash your hands because because man, that handle is superior to the other handle. I think is a false equivalency. I, I I don't see that as being a magic a magic wand. Now, could it change? Maybe, but right now I think that the evidence is not not really well, and the only thing I would add here is because, you know, Noel, Noel owns a textile company. So I've been spending a lot of time with that textile company. And I would just say when you see words like bleach cleanable or antimicrobial, try to understand what those mean to and, and if that property is important to you. Obviously, bleach cleanable means you can clean it down. And if they're, but like antimicrobial often means that it's protecting the fabric. 
reinforce that material, not necessarily, it's not killing a virus. So it's used in hospital settings so that bacterial and things don't grow on it. So it's not necessarily a virus or, or bacteria is gonna, it not actually not necessarily, it's not at all that it's gonna kill something. It's so that another microbe doesn't grow on top of it. So it's more about protecting the fabric or that material. So I just, you know, I just want to make sure as people see these things and say we're doing these things, they know what those properties mean instead of and, and have an understanding of what they are and if that's what they want for that particular use. No, that makes sense. Okay, here's uh, one, probably our, our last one. Looking down the road, have you thought about strategies for getting back to more efficient space utilization say one, two or three years from now when the social spacing is no longer an issue? I think we're gonna see a forever changed office that wants a little more space. I, and I hopefully, you know, I think, you know, obviously densification is gonna be an issue, but I think we're gonna solve it more from the flexibility that comes out instead of trying to cram people into more spaces, which I think we had gotten to a point that we had gotten too tight and trying to put too many people in less amount of space. And I think we're gonna see spacious, more spaciousness come back in what I was calling that kind of more humanity in, in the, the work environment. Yeah, there's been this, as I, as I said previously, there's been this constant tension between focus and collaboration space. And I, I think you're gonna see that pendulum swing back to more focus space or more privatized space in the office environment, which is going to uh, slowly and gradually increase the square foot per person. Uh, for, for for spaces in general, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Kylie. I think that's going to be a that's going to be a long term trend that we're going to see. And again, whether or not it gets offset by a certain percentage of people working from home to, to have a net neutral, or is it going to increase uh, the space requirements for tenants down the road? My gut tells me it's going to be more net neutral. Um, but who knows? My crystal ball is, is as clear as yours is, Tom. Yeah. Well, and and I'd like to end with just uh, you know mentioning the word you know awareness. Because I think if we can all be more aware that as our employees come back, you know, some may be, you know, scared to death and some may be bouncing back to, to get out, out of their work from home and, and leadership needs to be aware of the different, you know, just the different uh, levels of anxiety and, um, and communicate. That's something we've heard again and again today. I'd like to thank you, Kylie Roth and Daryl Fulbright. You've been an excellent panelists. Um, I hope everyone can make it for next week's, uh, which is uh, we're really talking about the future of food and beverage in Las Vegas and, 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 and around. And uh, really, I think it's titled, Do We Really Have to, to, to Cook Again? And um, <laughs> so it should be a great, uh, great panel. And with that, I'd like to sign off. And, and again, thank you, Las Vegas and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this has been an excellent opportunity for us to share some knowledge. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate you leading the panel here. Kylie, yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. If anyone right. has a question, feel free to reach out. All right. Bye.